Hello friends and family, and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for October 13th, Tuesday, the day after Thanksgiving. And I was rambling yesterday <laughs> about Thanksgiving and gratitude. And um, today I'll finish that thought regarding gratitude. And um, The idea of gratitude as it pertains to meditation is, um, I, I, don't, I don't want to get too theory oriented here, but um, the uh, kind of core of the notion that qualities sort of arise in a person when they meditate. Um, these have historically been known as the seven factors of enlightenment. And I think it's reasonably safe to say that I don't know a lot <laughs> about many of these. Um, but uh, at least one gets um, taken out and almost it's almost synonymous with meditation these days um, sati sati um, is translated into english as mindfulness most of the time uh, that's not meditation that's actually a quality which is a consequence of meditation as far as the seven factors of enlightenment are concerned. Um, and it's first in the list. Um, gratitude, however, is um, probably more likely tied to piti, piti um, which can is probably like maybe translated as um, happiness, joyfulness, gladness. And it comes from this awareness of the present. And all of these scales um, so a time scale for instance um, where our thought patterns might they might jump into the future they might go back into the past um, this time scale seems linear to us um, particularly if we write it down. But what we find is that it's actually, you know, logarithmic or something. <laughs> um, this time scale really tapers off quickly. And so the units we're measuring in tend to be this kind of order of magnitude units, right? Um, if I'm working backward from now, then the past, you know, three, four, five years, um, they're, they're fairly clear in my memory. I have a sense of what happened in them. And um, the granularity of those years is about kind of one year at a time one event per year. And the most recent year, I really have a granularity. I think I was even talking in yesterday's video about back in, in May and in June, <laughs> when we were moving to Jammu, um, that there's a real granularity of the things you remember 
uh, about you know four or five six months ago as being one month at a time so within the last year one month at a time within the last month one week at a time and within today on a regular mundane sort of day um, I'm remembering you know not even by the hour I'm remembering morning was like this lunchtime was like this afternoon was like this and um, as I come into the evening then the day collapses <laughs> it had three parts but really uh, it's just that day it was about all about this one task or it was all about this one journey or it was all about this one thought I couldn't get rid of something like that and if I move further back into the past then I start getting these kind of five year chunks um, and they may remain more or less five year chunks until my my birth right you know birth to five years that's a chunk early childhood <laughs> then five to ten years and then ten to fifteen fifteen to twenty twenty to twenty five I tend to remember my life in those sorts of chunks and as we move forward as we get further away um, those chunks may also collapse dissolve into one chunk right so Oh, then childhood is just, you know, from when you were a baby till when you were 10. And then is it the teenage years of 10 to 20 and so on and so forth. And this works in the other direction as well. So not into the future. The future is just a mirror, right? We imagine what the next year or two will be like. Oh, okay, what will the next decade be like? What will the rest of my life be like? Um, the further into the future you go, the fuzzier it gets. And so the nearer we get to the present, the sharper it gets. And this is where people, the people really lose track of this idea of the present moment, where we start thinking about the present moment and then we start thinking about the time units we're familiar with. Well, yeah, you know, okay, I know what a minute feels like. I've tried to sit, meditate for one minute. Okay, close my eyes. My breath is coming in. Breath is going out. <laughs> I'm feeling the breath. Oh, oh, right. Thinking about meditation is not meditation. Oh, okay, don't think, don't think. You just meditate and then a minute is gone and your mind may not have even been that close to meditation it may have been on any other aspect of of life what's going on what's going on for the next week and what, what this is is that if you're if you're trying to narrow down you know this this narrow space and your mind won't let you remain in that narrow space so it's constantly jumping out what happened? Oh, someone said, someone said this last week. Oh, I'm worried about this is going to happen next week or the next month. Um, and we generally don't worry too much about what happened in childhood. Unless there's some childhood trauma or something like that that maybe is coming up. But even that tends not to come up in... Uh, you know, in surface level meditation, and you're meditating for 20 or 30 minutes, you're not going to unearth some childhood trauma unless it was really just beneath the surface. Um, and I mean, in those particular cases, meditation is not the tool, right? Uh, maybe, maybe it's an aid in a whole bag of tools, but um, if there's trauma that close to the surface, then a uh, person needs to see a medical professional, um, not sit and try to meditate by themselves at home. But trauma aside, a person gets distracted by the things that are happening in their life, that seem to be happening in their life. Why can't we sleep? Why do we lie in bed and have this 
vibrating anxiety that prevents us from sleeping. It's because we're worried about some, oh, I have to do this tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow's tasks. Oh, this thing is coming up. Oh, I need to deal with this. Oh, what if this happens? What if this doesn't happen in the next week or two weeks or month? And that regardless of the time scale, um, it's, it's, always, it's always out here, right? On our logarithmic curves, going into the past, going into the future. And the further away you get, um, <laughs> at a certain point, you've kind of reached an inflection point in the graph. And it doesn't matter how, oh yeah, okay, like if I'm a week in the future or if I'm a year in the future, it's really, there's no difference, right? Neither of those things is meditating. Um, my mind is away, my mind has wandered away. Oh, okay, so I bring it back to the breath, which is relatively immediate, right? But this is sort of the boundary condition. Um, this is the boundary territory in the time scale, in this logarithmic time scale. So once we've got to a single breath, we're at the steep part of the graph, right? We're getting, we're going up. Once you have a single breath, then you can start to tease that breath apart. So you can say, oh, okay, I have half a breath. Oh, okay, the breath is coming in. I feel it for as long as it is naturally coming in. Okay, now it's sort of like stopping and turning around slowly and then it's going out and I feel it as it's going out. All right, so there it is. Natural breath, a single breath. And you may not have a lot of detail on the breath, but this, this is the boundary. So once we know one breath, then we can dig in. And we can find the parts, and then we can find the parts of the parts, and then we can find the parts of those parts. There's no bottom to this, really. Um, and the way that we get to these tiny pieces of time, tiny pieces of the breath in this very small space under the nose, is somewhat counterintuitively almost by continuity. So the continuity of the awareness has to be longer and longer. The longer you can maintain your attention on this thing, this small spot where the breath touches just under the nose and the nostrils and whatever, um, the longer you can hold your attention there, the smaller the space, the narrower the amount of time, the smaller the space will get, the narrower the amount of time, over and over you'll keep slicing it up. And you kind of slice it up naturally. You don't have to do anything to slice it up. And certainly if you actively try to get tinier and tinier time slices, you're not going to be able to do that. You have no conscious control over this scale of time. Or very quickly you won't. You can divide one breath in half or maybe into ten but into a hundred? No. <laughs> Your consciousness doesn't, it doesn't really have any control or ever any natural awareness of those sorts of timescales. So, okay, one breath sliced up into a hundred pieces. One breath sliced up into a thousand pieces. And we're not familiar with those kinds of timescales. And so it has to happen naturally. And the reason that it has to happen naturally is on one hand because we can't control this, but on the other hand because the whole process itself is about what is natural, about what is unconscious. Unconsciously, we can observe these tiny timescales. Consciously, we can't. And so this is a great deal of difficulty that comes up with this this terminology of the present moment, as if somehow that's a thing you already have a handle on. Oh yes, the present moment, ah yes, now. 
<laughs> be in the now as if that means anything. Um, now is, is mathematically complex um, and it's relatively simple to get to, but you won't find it in conscious space. Um, so this is part of the, the challenge, right? When, when people try to discuss these things, when people try to write them down in books and give talks and whatever, um, and I mean, these videos for the three people that are watching them um, may tread in that same dangerous territory. I'm not sure, hopefully not, but the activity of finding these minute timescales, minute physical spaces within the body, um, they can't be described. And so then when people go to try to describe them, oh, let me tell you about meditation in my book, they will look for analogs or they will look for objects of attention which are large enough, coarse-grained enough that you can get a handle on them and you can say, oh, yes. <laughs> my, when I worry about my taxes, ah, yes, that's a thought and I'll label it taxes. <laughs> then I put it in the drawer for thoughts labeled taxes. This is, I mean, this is not meditation really. I mean, it's one of many, many, many potential gateways to meditating, but um, this is a sort of active conscious activity um, and it's outside this boundary and this boundary of a single breath. Um, you won't have time if you divide one breath up into a thousand pieces. You don't have time between one piece and the next, one piece and the next to have a thought, right? There's no time for you to say, ah, yes, taxes. Let me put it in the drawer. <laughs> um, there's no space for that. You have to be quiet enough inside that you are able to simply follow, keep following, keep following. If you find yourself slipping, you're, it's like skiing or riding a bicycle or swimming, running, any activity, even reading a book, right? If I'm skiing and I start to slip, I need to engage myself. I need to get back into my tracks. I don't want to fall down. If I'm riding a bicycle, especially as a small child, I have feet getting wobbly. I need to start paying attention again. Oh, okay, back on the bicycle, pay attention to the bicycle. And that's what you're doing with meditation. You're reading a book and your mind wanders off to, oh yeah, this, this character is doing this thing in this environment. Yeah, I'm imagining it. And then you start imagining something adjacent to that environment. Oh, that reminds me of this. Well, that makes me think of that. Oh, I wish this were this way. And all of a sudden you look down at your book and you haven't moved from the sentence that you were reading 10 minutes ago. This happened to me a lot as a kid. I was a daydreamer. <laughs> There's a lot of daydreaming happening while I'm supposed to be reading. And again, with meditation, your, the goal is to, to remain with the subject matter. Right? So if you read and you daydream, there's really no harm. <laughs> it's, it might take you a little longer to finish a book, but if you enjoy a book that way, good enough. But if you're daydreaming while you're meditating, that is the harm. The goal is to remain with this sliced up chunk of time for as long as possible. Keep remaining, keep remaining. I find myself slipping away. I'm thinking about some environment. I'm thinking about some event. I'm wishing for a thing. Okay, come back. Breath, 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 the whole way along. And if gratitude is inherently our ability to be thankful for the thing which is there, if it is it diametrically opposed to wishful thinking, then the thing that is there 
is the thing that we need to pay attention to. And what is there, <laughs> this is going to get annoying, what is there is the present moment. So <laughs> the, the farther we can slide up this curve, right, and de describing it as logarithmic, I mean, it's a logarithmic, it's probably a terrible explanation, but the closer we can get inside of the inflection point of the boundary, the closer we can get to the actual present, however small that is, and it is very, very, very small, um, the more we've excluded all of the past, all of the future, we are thinking less and we are more focused on this one thing which is actually true, time-wise, right? Um, but the consequence of this is that if we're able to focus that narrowly on the present moment, actual, real, concrete thing, right? <laughs> And there is only, only one little teeny tiny moment is actually true at any given point in time. I had a meditation teacher tell me once, a Vipassana meditation teacher during the Anapana session. Um, he said, oh, are you getting distracted a lot? He was, uh, he was speaking in Sinhala, so someone was translating for him. <laughs> um, he said, you, oh, you're getting distracted a lot. Um, and I said, ah, yes, I am getting distracted thinking, remembering things, and he said, oh, you, all of that is your imagination. You're sitting in this room, cross-legged, eyes closed. All of it is imagination. You can't be remembering anything real. And I, I know, I know. <laughs> and he says, even the last breath was your imagination. It's not there anymore. The breath that is gone is gone, and there is nothing to see there. And so this continues, right? If my memories of being back home in Bangalore at the time are imagination, and if the last breath is imagination, then even the last fragment of breath is imagination. The only true thing is this extremely, extremely narrow band of time. And even that can be subdivided, always. And so as we get better at that through continuity, we hold our attention longer, we hold our attention longer, not by force, but just by repeatedly bringing our attention back, repeatedly bringing our attention back. Okay, our attention is here on the breath. Then everything else just goes away. If your attention is on the breath continuously after some time, right, it takes some practice, but if you can hold the attention on the breath continuously, then your attention is not on the past and it is not wishing for things in the future. And there's a, another factor of enlightenment, which is equanimity. Um, it is again, emergent. <laughs> so we're not necessarily trying to cultivate equanimity I'm going to force myself to be equanimous. Um, but to be okay with this thing that is happening, the feeling under my nose at this moment due to the breath, whatever that is, to be okay with that and everything else that's going on. So all these distracting thoughts and things, to be okay with them. I'm not angry at them. I'm not getting upset. I accept that these thoughts are there and I come back to the breath. The longer we can stay with the breath continuously at a stretch, the less our mind is in wishful thinking mode. And the less our mind is in wishful thinking mode, the better, the more gratitude we feel because these things are diametrically opposed. Um, it is not that easy right? <laughs> the, the gratitude, which is emergent, um, it's a very strong gratitude, which comes up in meditation. It's, it's almost overwhelming. 
Um, and it's a nice, it's a nice feeling. But the kind of gratitude that we're looking for in our daily meditation practice is not this otherworldly, all-encompassing kind of gratitude. Oh, I'm so thankful for my parents and my teachers and my brother and my sister and everyone is so wonderful. I'm so thankful. You don't need that kind of earth-shattering gratitude to, uh, to erupt from somewhere inside. You just need to get up from your meditation and see how your family members are behaving, see how your life is carrying on, and to be okay with that. <laughs> and, and perhaps even a bit grateful. Um, and grateful for all these different component parts and the complexity um, that brings your life to where it is now. And in the same way that our meditation practice becomes more natural, the more that we practice it, okay, I keep practicing, bringing the attention back, bringing the attention back, it becomes natural for the attention to come back to the breath or the body. Um, it becomes natural for us to feel some measure of gratitude. It's you know, not this overwhelming, <laughs> unbelievable volcanic eruption of gratitude, but um, rather just basic thankfulness, day to day, moment to moment. Um, and honestly, I, I think that that's all that anyone is really looking for in meditation. And once a person finds that, then they know that there's, there's not much else there. Yeah, sure, there's all these uh, supra mundane experiences and all of those sorts of things, but um, those tend to be a source for wishful thinking. They tend to be a source for craving. Oh, I wish I could experience that again. How wonderful, how amazing. Um, and, and that in itself is dangerous. So it's actually quite good to have regular old boring meditation experiences and to find these small improvements in your life where you're a little more thankful, you're able to express your gratitude, and you're able to help others because you know that they need it or they know that your love is appreciated, your good deeds are appreciated. Um, and not that you're doing it for the appreciation, but you, you understand the intrinsic value. It does take time though. <laughs> so um, I do hope that for the few people that are still watching some of these, um, that you do give uh, a sincere and an earnest trial to some Anapana meditation, mornings and evenings, um, just a little bit here and there. And I would be curious to hear um, how it's going for you. Are you having these sorts of experiences that I'm describing? Or are you having different experiences? Um, are there specific difficulties that you're having? Um, are you finding it's not valuable at all? I, it's totally a possibility. Um, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how it's going. Um, in the meantime, I hope that you are all taking good care of yourselves and that you're taking good care of everyone around you. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.